now from redstate.com and also co-host of the Red and Black Show, Jeff Charles. Jeff, guns are one of those things that make people who aren't familiar with them uncomfortable. I, I noticed it when I first got married. My wife didn't grow up around them. She'd see one of mine laying on the table and she genuinely thought the thing was just going to go off. Is, that, is, what, is the problem we have in this country just the naivete about them? You know, I think it's just a lot. Yeah, it's, it's a lack of education. I mean, I, I've seen videos with people who really support the First Amendment um, interact with people who don't really know much about guns and are afraid of them, like you said, and very much for gun control. But once they get more educated about what gun control is and what guns actually are, and, um, you know, when they're more educated on the subject, then they're less afraid of it. They may not, they still may not choose to own a gun themselves. But I think with this is one of those issues where once the education is there, you don't really need to persuade a whole lot. You just, now the other person actually knows what's going on. They understand what how guns work, and common sense kind of kicks in. So yeah, I think it's it's not even tape, but I think it's really just a lack of education. Jeff, the Republican Party's messaging on guns. Well, I despise it. Now, I know that's unsurprising because I despise many things about the Republican Party, but I, I feel like we give up ground to the left and do that. Well, I also like hunting and fishing thing. The Second Amendment had nothing to do with hunting deer, nothing whatsoever, and I don't understand why we feel like you have to message things that way. Or am I wrong? No, I don't think you're wrong. I mean, and I, also, I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with bringing up hunting and fishing, but when that's it, then you're not really... Uh, you're not really delving into what the Second Amendment was really about. The Second Amendment was about pushing back against the government when it becomes too intrusive. And I think a lot of times we get afraid of going there because we sound like conspiracy theorists. I mean, we, we, I think I, I think we might be concerned that people might think that we're we're saying that the government is plotting to, to oppress us and that we're back in 1776. But the reality is that this is supposed to be a check on the government. So if you put it a certain way, you don't sound crazy. I mean, now to, now to people on the far left, you're always going to sound crazy when you criticize the government because they believe that the government is the source of everything great in the world. But to people who don't, I, I think it makes sense to talk about the, the, the possibility that if the wrong people get into power, they might use that power to crack down on our rights and we need to be able to defend ourselves. So I think I, I, I see nothing wrong with messaging it that way because it is a very it is a very real re uh, possibility. We see what, what happens in other countries. This stuff doesn't happen overnight. So I, I see nothing wrong with talking about how it helps to preserve our liberty and yes, allows us to hunt and fish and it allows us to defend ourselves. Where do you think? Where do you see the Republican Party having consistently screwed up with its messaging over the decades, 10, 20 years? Where have we really missed the mark? Well, I mean, I, th I mean, the, the Republican Party has a, a messaging messaging problem overall. So I think a lot of it is in what you've said, but I think it's really in not holding our ground and really explaining to people what the Second Amendment is really about. Like I said, the Second Amendment to me is a, is a really different animal because, like I said, you don't have to do a whole lot of persuasion. If you educate people and if you focus on educating the, the populace and people who are leery about guns, you're going to automatically win people over. On, on top of that, we haven't really delved into the history of the gun control movement and how it's affected uh, minorities. I mean, that, that's the left's favorite thing to talk about, and yet they push for a, a legislation that makes it harder for black, and, black men and black women to defend themselves. So I think not only educating on how guns work and how the Second Amendment work, but we need to do better. And this is one of those few areas where I think we need to point out how the left is wrong and how, what their, and how their ideas are dangerous when it comes to this issue. How has it hurt black people? I know this was one of those things during those Black Lives Matter riots where, where people would put up these videos online of a bunch of black men walking down the street armed as if someone was going to care. I've never cheered so loud in my life. I want everybody in society armed. That's all fine by me. But apparently a lot of people had a major problem with it. How has the left hurt them? Yeah, I mean, the, the very origins of gun control was specifically designed to keep weapons out of the hands of freed black slaves. But you fast forward into now, and you look at uh, like a Joe Biden's plan, which, by the way, if, it, if, if the Washington Post is willing to put out an article criticizing your plan on guns, you're probably doing something wrong. I mean, they, they, they said he, even he goes too far. Basically, the, the way they do it now is they 
put so many restrictions on gun ownership and, and they make it so expensive to own weapons that people that, that the, the people who are poor or middle class, it's hard for them to, to afford to own one. This isn't just at the federal level. This is even at, at the city level. I mean, lo local, like Chicago, Philadelphia, they put so many different fees on it that the only people who can actually own, own guns are people who are more well off. So who does, who does this inadvertently affect? It affects people in Chicago who might need to have that protection, but they can't afford to pay for all the regulations and the rules involved in, in getting a weapon. And under Biden's plan, if he succeeds, people who already own guns will have to pay even more to register them with the government. I mean, and, and his plan covers what, what he calls assault weapons, but that, but his, by his definition, that can cover handguns, shotguns, it can cover rifles, AR-15s. So that the way they make it harder for black people to get guns now is by putting so many different fees and fines and, and what have you that if, they, if they're going to own a gun, they have to do it illegally. And guess what? If they get caught, that makes it even harder for them to own a gun. Jeff, what is the problem in Chicago? So, uh, not to change the subject off the guns, but what is the problem there? People love to hold up Chicago and their murder numbers, and it's a disaster. Is it just as simple as Chicago is a central drug hub used by the cartels, and therefore the street gangs fight over that? Is, that, is it just that simple? I think that's part of it. But, I mean, if you look at any major city, Chicago, Baltimore, D.C., um, this isn't always very popular on the right, but the main problem is that the Democrats have a lack of competition. They have no incentive to do better for the, the, the residents who, who live in those cities. The Baltimore people, Baltimore as well, their governments are corrupt. I've spoken with candidates who, who run at the local level in those, in those cities, and, and they're, they're just full of corruption. And the government will, their local governments will pretend that they care, but in reality, they don't want to do anything about, it, about any of this. So they're not really going to crack down on crime because they don't really have to do anything. Now, if they had actual competition from the GOP, then they'd either lose or they'd be forced to actually implement policies that would make a difference, even beyond crime. I mean, talking about edu education, economic policy. So I think that that's really what it is. They'll, they'll play the lip service game because they know they're going to get the votes anyway. And in a lot of cases, especially in Chicago, at the local level and at the state level, People are running out of post. Democrats run a post. They don't even have to campaign. They win the primary, then they just coast for the, for the rest of the election season. So there are a lot of different factors that figure into that, but I think that's one of the main ones. What do we do about it, Jeff? Look, I, it's easy to point fingers, but mm -hmm. I, I haven't run here. It's not like I've run here in Houston. I ran for Congress a couple times in Arizona. It is a slog to run for, for office, especially when you sure. know, I mean, you pretty much know you're going to get your teeth kicked in. You run in an all-black neighborhood in Chicago, you're going to lose by a lot. And I mean a lot. You run as a Republican in an all-black neighborhood in Chicago. So how do we convince good people to do it so we can win over time and bring our messaging there? You know, I, I think a lot of it is being realistic. And I tell Republicans all the time, I mean, this is, this is a marathon, not a sprint. You're not going to win at first. But if the GOP were to focus on supporting candidates in areas where they can win, because believe it or not, there are areas in some of those cities where a Republican would have a chance then I think that over time, we would see a difference. Again, it, it's not going to happen in one or two years. It might take five up to, up to 10 years to actually make inroads in these cities. But I think the key is to really focus on, on areas where a Republican candidate would have a much better shot of beating that incumbent. And the more, and the more Republicans show up and actually support the candidates who show up, that, that, in that way, the Republicans can kind of uh, rebuild the trust that the black community used to have in the GOP. How'd they lose that trust? Ooh, that, that might take me a while to explain, but um, again, it's not very popular, but it started right after Reconstruction. Um, it started from Reconstruction and up until now. I mean, if you look at uh, the Lily White movement that came up in the Republican Party, that movement is very inconvenient for the Republican Party, but it was specifically designed to alienate black voters so that they can focus on other voters in the South. So when they started kicking, literally kicking out black Republicans in the South who helped to build the party, then it's, it started there, it continued on. And there were always people on the, in the Republican Party who were trying to fight this, to, to stay true to their roots. 
But um, but over that time, and then you go up to the 60s where they, yes, they did vote for civil rights legislation, but then uh, Goldwater came on the scene. And again, this won't be popular again, but Goldwater basically put the knife in the heart of GOP outreach to the black community. He very explicitly said that he's not going to try to win over black voters because it's not worth it. Um, he wouldn't support civil rights legislation um, it, in that time. And he got 6% of the black vote. And since then, um, I don't think any Republican presidential candidate has gotten over 15% of the black vote. But it wasn't just at the presidential level. Um, a lot of the people who followed him had that same approach at the local and state level. So at, at a certain period, they kind of just gave up and surrendered the black vote to the Democrats. And so th there's actually a lot more to that, but I'm just giving you the, the, the thumbnail version of it. But that's essentially uh, what happened. Uh, the Democrats were oh. willing to offer certain things and they, a lot of them were leftist policies and black people went from because the Republicans wouldn't offer anything to compete with that. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you did. I find it interesting. You know what? I'm having you on again next week because I want to talk about this with you. Jeff Charles always has something to you. say. Thank you, my man. I appreciate you. No problem. You have a good one. Be good. We'll be back.